Um, okay, so this is mechanical concepts, lesson number one. We're going to talk about some benefits of mechanical, first of all. So if you're taking tech design or in the side tech program, um, these concepts are going to help you quite a bit uh, with that class. And if you're not taking tech design, you should be taking tech design, despite what anyone will tell you. Um, and besides that, uh, you know, it's also good for your university applications, especially when you're going to go into any field of engineering. Um, having these concepts is vital. So moving on from that, we can get into the actual mechanical aspects, but since this year we're online, there's not anything we can actually do with our hands, which is usually what we're doing as mechanical people. So unfortunately, that means we need to use CAD. I'm not gonna show you how to install CAD or actually how to use it that much. Uh, I'll, we'll, I'm gonna go over the basics uh, of how to do CAD, just so like even if you're really a beginner, you'll still be able to do it. But there's a lot of things that I'm not gonna waste time doing with like installing Fusion 360 or installing Inventor. Uh, so you can, this slides link will be provided to you. You can go to the installation link. You can get a student license, which gives you it free for a year. Just show them your student ID. Just prove that you're a student. Basically, it, it works for Chinkuzi. Um, they have that registered as a school now. So you can get that for free for a year. Install it. Um, you probably already have it installed if you've taken any tech design course. Um, if not, go ahead and do that. Uh, we'll be covering the CAD in, in the next lesson. Uh, and also, you can just look up tutorials and that type of stuff as well. But this lesson is more focused on principles rather than specific implementation in the CAD software. So with that out of the way, uh, one thing about when you're CADing, especially for in the in-season, and even when we go into these mini competitions after this, uh, you know, this training series is done. Give me a second. Sorry about that. Uh, so after this mini series is done, um, then we can go into the competitions or mini intramurals. You'll want to apply these best practices there as well. So first of all, don't CAD everything custom. Uh, because we use parts from suppliers like VexPro, Andymark, and Studica, Rev Robotics. So you're not going to want to uh, custom... Uh, CAD those things because we're not going to actually custom manufacture them. So there's no use in CADing them. Um, and it's probably going to be much different than what we actually use. So just use the uh, CAD, which is actually already supplied by all these suppliers. If you go on any of the product pages for whatever you're looking for, you will see a CAD um, file available. There will be a standard step file or STL file, which you'll be able to import into either Fusion 360 or Inventor. OK, the CAD is out of the way for now. Uh, we'll be going on to the more mechanical focused concepts, but uh, homework if you can call it that for the, before the next session is to install the cad the reason i'm not going over cad right now is because if there's anyone who hasn't installed it i don't want to ha have them left behind so your homework is to install either fusion 360 or inventor uh probably use inventor if you're because that's what you're going to learn in your tech class if if you're not planning to take tech design in the future you should by the way but if you're not then maybe use inventor because it's more beginner friendly it's an easier learning curve uh but again and then your choice whichever to install you can do a little bit of research on which one, and then you can solve that. But I'll skip over that for now, um, and we'll get into the engineering design process, but not really. Probably because most of you already know it and have heard it a million times every single year. Essentially, it's a, well, depending on who you ask, it's different. In grade nine and 10, you might learn the SPICE process, and then in grade 11, you learn the full 11 step or 12 step engineering design process. So there's many different variations of it, but the fundamentals are the same, and it's just a structure you follow to design a product. And let's don't tell tech teachers, but you don't need to follow that rigidly as long as you're doing. Uh, the best practices. Okay, so you don't need to follow every 11 steps as long as you get the general idea for it. So basically, specific to FRC, what you're going to want to do, the first thing you're going to do, game comes out, the team sits down together, and we assess the game for that year. We understand what the rules are, which means read the game manual, because if you don't, you're going to come up with this really overpowered design, and then you're going to realize, oh, you're not actually allowed to do that. That's why it's so overpowered, because it's not allowed. So read the game manual, understand the rules. There's a lot of stuff that go in the game manual that they don't mention in the video which the videos basically, if they release a video every year, uh, kind of just briefly glancing over what the challenge is going to be. So once you understand that, make a strategy of how you want to maximize scoring points. So there might be, what is the best way to score points for that year without putting that much mechanical or programming energy into it? So what's your biggest uh, success for your minimum amount of effort? So once you have that plan, and that plan is not done by any given individual, it's done by the whole team in a brainstorming session. Um, then everyone starts go and they go off and the frenzy starts of trying to make designs, right? Everyone's creating something. Some are crazy, some are simple, but that's your, that's your design stage. And then we kind of kind of filter that down a little bit after that frenzy. And we start prototyping certain things to see what works and what doesn't. I'll get into the prototyping a little bit later because it's really important how you do that. And then based on what you learned in the prototyping, you're going to want to uh, repeat that until it's really good, basically. You keep improving small improvements, what you learned from the last time. 
and then you build your final version. So that's not a lot of detail and it skips a lot of steps. So if you want to know more about the engineering design process, if you don't already know it, um, you're going to Google that if you want more detail or more likely ask your tech teacher and they'll be more than happy to tell you all about it. Okay. So one thing that we want to focus on though is prototyping uh, because often people, when they prototype, they actually just build the full final thing. They cut it, they laser cut everything on like aluminum or sheet metal or really good polycarbonate. Um, and that's a waste of money. So initial prototyping should be really, really rough. Like the first time you've got an idea in your head and you want to test it out, it needs to be really rough. Like someone could be holding a drill and spinning a motor to see if can a wheel even lift this power cell up? Can it pick up the ball? Like, does it have enough traction? Does the wheel have enough traction? Is that viable? What difficulties do you run into in doing that that you might not have considered? So you start super rough. Like, that means probably not even machining anything, just holding stuff in your hand, getting a couple of people to hold it, maybe using some vices or clamps to hold things down. Then you slowly, again, you make it more impressive. Now maybe you uh, use, like, scrap wood. And then from scrap wood, you maybe use some, now you use some uh, plastics and things like that. You make your way up. But in the beginning, you want to find out things that interact just with game piece interaction not really how everything in the CAD is going to go. Now, the CAD is going to be built based on what you f for, uh, learn in this design process. So let's say you're shooting a ball. You want to see how much compression do you need on that ball. So the CAD can be built a general shooter, but then the exact value for how far apart the two flywheels are going to be from each other, that's going to be based off of what you learned in your prototyping. So CAD and prototyping can actually, in, in a little bit, in a sense, go up in parallel, but the dimensions and stuff like that in the CAD are going to be influenced by the prototyping. Okay, so tiny, tiny bit of physics we need to cover uh, just because things, we're going to talk about best, best practices later. And to understand why those best practices make sense, you're going to want to learn uh, a little bit of physics. And we're not going to get into detail because, I mean, again, uh, this is robotics, not science. But though <laughs> that's a stupid sentence because they're really integrated, which is why we're going into it a little bit. Um, so you have three classes of levers. Uh, you might be only used to the first class of lever, which is like your typical seesaw. Um, and you probably know that the further away you are from the fulcrum, the more force you get. Um, you have to move more as well, because we'll uh, get into that a little bit later. But, you know, total power is conserved. So that's the first lesson lever. I won't go into that much, because you probably know it's a seesaw. Uh, you have your fulcrum, that's the pivot point, and then the two ends. The second class lever um, is kind of like, you know, if you're ever trying to take a hammer. Sorry, you're trying to, like a wheelbarrow. So a wheelbarrow, the wheel is the pivot, uh, or the or fulcrum. And then your load is in between where you hold it and the fulcrum. So that's the characteristics of a second glass lever. As you can see, the load is in between the fulcrum and your effort. Um, so that still gives you mechanical advantage. Now the third class, so both the first and second class levers, they both give you mechanical advantage. And when I say mechanical advantage, I mean that you, you're you putting in less force to get out more force. Um, of course, you have to put in more distance because as I mentioned, uh, the pow total power is conserved and power is a factor of, you know, how fast or how much you're working, like the extent of it, and then like how much force you're producing. That's a horrible explanation. Um, but basically in this context, especially the amount you move, you're sacrificing how much power you get for how much you move, or you're sacrificing how much you move for how much power you get. So you have always have to sacrifice one of those two things. Um, and then the third class lever though, you don't get mechanical advantage. You actually, um, you're, actually, you know, you're losing force because uh, you're, your effort is closer to the fulcrum and your load is further away. So whenever your effort is more close to the point of rotation, or in this case, it's called the fulcrum, compared to what you're trying to lift, that becomes harder to do. So, I mean, you can probably test this if you have anything heavy around you. Uh, kind of stick your hand, so if you want to do it really quickly, you can literally try, you know, even, even if it's not that heavy, even if it's just your water bottle or something like that, um, you'll be able to find the difference. So if you just pick up anything heavy around you, uh, stick your hand out and lift it up, you'll notice, it, and then it's a lot harder compared to if you pull your hand all the way in and now you try lifting it up where it's all the way uh, inside, that's a lot easier to do. Okay, so those are basically your three classes of levers. Um, oftentimes you'll see, especially in robotics, a third class lever being an arm. So you have an arm rotating from a pivot point. Um, and if you, have, if you have a lot of load at the end of the arm, the longer the arm is, the more work your motor is going to have to do to lift that load, right? Because the further you get away, uh, from your fulcrum. So we'll actually get into a little bit of how to calculate how much force that is. So that was the kind of the general idea. And here is that through the lens of numbers really quickly. So since we are usually going to deal with first and third class levers, uh, that's what we're going to talk about now. But basically this, the principle of how to calculate that force is the same for all of them. Um, so your force is going to be whatever force you put in times, you know, the distance you are away from the, the fulcrum. So from the, your pivot point. 
So your actual force is your force times your distance from the fulcrum. So that means the further, so let's say the further you go from the fulcrum, the more force you actually get. Uh, so if you have a longer lever, um, you're gonna be able to lift up more weight. Of course, you'll have to move a lot more too because that distance gets increased as again, we talked about this before, but it's kind of important. You can never just get more power without losing anything else. In this case specifically, you're getting more power, but you're losing the fact that you have to travel more to achieve that now. Um, and this also works against you if you're trying to move, uh, if, you're, if your effort is close to the fulcrum or even at the point of rotation, like if a motor is spinning it at the point of rotation, then the longer that fulcrum is and the more load you're trying to lift, the further away, that means that motor now has to put in more effort. So that force, again, can be calculated by your, the force that's there multiplied by the distance from the fulcrum. So now torque is very, is very this concept of torque is pretty similar. Uh, to actually, at first it might not look similar, but it is similar to levers um, in the sense that, you know, it, it, it's ro it's still rotational. Uh, it's You still get force multiplication based on how long your distance from your pivot point is. Um, but it's not actually your distance just based on how long your lever arm is. So like in this example, there's a wrench. It's not just how long your wrench is. It actually depends where, where, what direction the force is being applied. Because if you think about it, it makes sense. Like just because you're, if you push straight into the nut or bolt, you're not going to get any force. Whereas if you pull perpendicular to it, you're going to get a lot more force. So it's actually, if you can look at, you know, you see the three images of wrenches, uh, the, the wrench in the upper right-hand corner, you'll see that the 1.5 feet from the bolt to the end of the wrench, that's your actual distance. Um, the same formulas we talked about for levers apply here too, but it's just with that. So it's um, your horizontal or vertical, whichever is the closest um, to whatever force you're applying. That's your distance. You multiply that by how much force you get, um, and that's you know that's that's your to that's your actual force that you're getting. So that's kind of complicated way of saying that. If you have a robot arm and you keep everything the same, it's the same amount of force, the same distance from the pivot point. If that arm is like all the way up, 90 degrees up. So that the force is just going straight through the arm that motor is going to be feeling like in, in an ideal world zero force or in, in real world though probably just a very little amount of force whereas if that arm is 90 degrees to the ground is going to be feeling the most force there if it's a little bit more up a little bit less force if it's a little bit more down a little bit less force so the, when it's perpendicular that's when it feels the most force when you're screwing when you're uh, tightening a nut that's in your benefit when you're trying to hold up an object that's not uh, easy for you. That's what makes it worse for you. Again, you can take a heavy object around you, just try and hold it up straight in front of you versus push your hand up straight up in the air. And you'll see that that force, it kind of goes away. You can still feel the weight, but your muscles no longer have to take the weight. It's kind of your bone structure that takes the weight, which can, which can hold a lot more. And you know, it doesn't take as much out of the motor to do that. In this case, it doesn't take that much out of you to do that. Okay, so that was a little bit of physics. Hopefully no one went to sleep. Um, we'll get back to the mechanical, strictly mechanical side of it, I should say. Well, that's unfortunate for us. It's okay. We're coming back um, to structure. So we talked about uh, materials and we talked a little bit about this in the prototyping. Um, we talked about using uh, plastics and woods. And those are the kind of materials you want to use for two reasons. One, they're really cheap. Two, you can easily, easily machine them. You know, machine them. Some of them, I mean, you can literally cut with a pair of scissors, like the cardboard. Um, so those are the type of materials that you want to use for prototyping because that makes it uh, easiest to iterate, which is very important in prototyping. So some of those materials are wood, uh, preferably scrap wood. You could even go up to some hardware stores like Home Depot, um, ask for their scraps, and you might get them for free. Uh, and then cardboard, again, you, that's for very light duty applications. You can cut that up with scissors. So of course, no machining skill required there. Hardboard is very similar. Uh, and then coral passages. Some of those things you find on the election signs when they put them in your yard for like vote this or do that, uh, vote for this person, that type of material. Anything that's really easy to machine, I, I could hardly call it machining. Anything that's really easy to modify its shape, uh, you can use for prototypes. Another thing is VEX. Um, so ve the VEX building system um, is very easy to go together. It, everything has pre-drilled holes and everything kind of lines up. So it makes for a very good uh, prototyping system. The one thing I should mention, uh, so all these prototypes you could likely be doing on a smaller scale especially with the VEX, you're probably testing out an idea. Like let's say you're testing out uh, a lift. You'll test out the mechanism on a smaller scale. What you, need to think, what, you, what you need to keep in mind is that things react differently at different scales. So just because your um, flipper worked uh, at, on, on a VEX scale does not mean it's gonna work on an FRC scale where you have a lot more weight. Despite, you know, you're scaling up your materials. So technically they should be getting stronger, but that strength to weight ratio sometimes comes into play. And just because something works on a smaller scale does not mean it's gonna work 
on a larger scale. And then for your final. I'm on, I'm on. Okay, okay. People in the chat are asking you to go slower because you're going a little bit too fast. So if you could just uh, slow it down and make it comprehensible, that would be appreciable. Sounds good. I'll take a pause right now uh, and just ask if anyone. I feel like I might have lost some people with the physics. Is there any questions about that? I should probably take a pause before we go further on. You can just type them in the chat or you can unmute your mic. Otherwise, I can continue going slower if you're good till this point. I don't get the lever bit. Like, what are you talking about? Can you re 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 explain what you're talking about there? Sure. So I'll stray away from the abstract and I'll talk more practically. Um, so let's say you want to, uh, so let's say you have, you're on a seesaw. That's the simplest for the first class lever. Um, and your friend is a lot heavier than you are, but you still want to be balanced. The way you would achieve that balance is you would extend your part of the seesaw to reach further out from the fulcrum. So the fulcrum is the point of rotation where the thing uh, tips back and forth from. That's your fulcrum. If you wanted to balance a heavier weight, you could do so with a lighter weight if you just extend the distance from the fulcrum. Um, the same thing applies for a second class lever. The closer you move your load in, so your load could be your friend that you want to balance. The, well, in this case, not really a seesaw. So that's not really applicable. But let's say it's, it's a wheelbarrow, uh, which is a second class lever. The closer you move your weight towards your fulcrum and the further you get away from that fulcrum, the more mechanical advantage you're going to get. Specifically, uh, it's, it, it's, um, it's linear. So you the further you get away, you can actually multiply your distance by how much force you get, uh, how much force you're inputting, let's say in Newtons, and then you'll get how much force you're actually exerting uh, on your load. So we can do an example. Um, you can see a lever in balance. So what that means, you see a so box M2 is obviously bigger than box M1. It's more, it, it, it weighs more. But the fact that it's closer to the pivot point means that um, it's actually able to be balanced by M1, which is a lot further away from the pivot point. So let's say M2 weighs twice as much as M1. And we can actually give those numbers. Like we can say M2 weighs 50 pounds, or let's make it even easier. M2 weighs 100 pounds, M1 weighs 50 pounds. Right, so if M2 weighs 100 pounds and M1 weighs 50 pounds, and we know that the lever is in balance, then we know in total that the force must be equal, like the actual force. Uh, so we and we can see that D2 is a lot shorter than D1. So D2 is the distance from the fulcrum to the box. So since M2 weighs twice as much, it's twice as close to the fulcrum as compared to M1. So in other ways, like M M1 is twice as far from the fulcrum as M2 because it's only half as heavy. And since it's in balance, if it wasn't in balance, it's a whole different situation. Uh, but since it's in balance, since it's in balance, the two sides of the lever, the actual force on that lever is the same, which means that the distance times the force, that's the same. Whereas you can you can you can increase the distance and decrease the force and things like that to get it to be the same, but th the final result is the same. Does that answer your question, or do you have a different question? No, that answers my question. Okay, great. Are there other questions? Um, where can I do more research on this? Like, maybe watch more videos? Sure, there's like really great YouTube videos. Um, if you've ever seen those science videos, really, there's not, I don't have a specific a YouTube channel or a specific uh, website, but honestly, just Google levers, watch a couple of them. I'm sure you'll find one that really clicks with you. So just Google uh, physics levers uh, or physics torque, and those are going to be some really good videos. And they'll have typically nice animations, which I'm not able to show you right now. Um, so if you want to go further research about the science part of that, you can definitely just Google it, which is actually general advice for a lot of things. <laughs> if you don't have an understanding, typically your best answer, your best course of action is to just Google it. Armand, as a resource, why did you post our type textbook from last quad? I can do that later. Yeah, I can do that later for sure. There were, yeah, so there was a textbook in grade 11 tech, tech design that had some pretty good resources explaining a lot of, actually, a lot of mechanical principles, including levers. Give me a lever long enough and I'll move the earth, for sure. Though you need a fulcrum and material strong enough, but we can overlook that. Um, so I assume there's no, many, no more questions. If there are, uh, you can definitely ask them right now. We'll go back. So are there any questions about torque? Let me maybe prompt for some questions. Were there any questions about torque? Uh, maybe you got levers, but you didn't get torque. 
No, I already know what it is, but I'd just like to say, would you like to explain what um, what Torque is for anyone who did, might not know? Because we have great nods in here, so we might, we might need to explain some of the concepts. Like, I should have mentioned that earlier. But yeah. Right, so Torque, I mean, Torque is basically oh. rotational force. Um, it's the force you feel specifically relating to rotation. So as an example is when you're screwing, when you're tightening a bolt, that's, and the amount of force you put into your, uh, your wrench, and depending on the length of your wrench, that's the torque that that bolt experiences. That is, it also applies to concepts, um, when you're spinning, like you say, you're spinning a flywheel or you're using a drivetrain motor, those concepts ha uh, heavily apply. So, you know, the obvious one is speed. How fast is that thing spinning? But then there's also torque, which is how much rotational force is that exerting? Um, and that's dependent, again, is very similar to levers. If you can think of the uh, the fulcrum as like the center of the circle or the center of the wheel or whatever you're rotating, the center point from where it's rotating, and then the circum the diameter, or I said the radius, not the diameter, as the lever arm, the same calculations apply. Um, and the unique thing about torque, though, is it does matter like kind of what angle the force is coming in at. So if you look at the images of the wrench, when the wrench is 90 degrees parallel with the ground, and the force is going vertical, straight down 90 degrees, um, that's when you get the most torque. Whereas if the lever arm is at an angle, in this case, it's shown to be raised up slightly, uh, and then your force is still perpendicular, it's no longer perpendicular to the lever arm, it's now perpendicular to the ground, so the reference point is different. Um, so that's no longer perpendicular to the lever arm, which means you're not getting the same amount of force. And an extreme example, if it's parallel with the lever arm, you get zero force. And that makes sense. Like, if you try tightening a, a bolt um, by pressing into the lever, it's not going to work. You have to make that rotational motion. Um, but th again, there's that middle ground where it's like, it's it's not exactly 90 degrees. It's not exactly parallel. You'll still get less force there. And then that kind of applies to uh, what, what I talked about earlier is that applies to an arm. Like, if you have a mechanical, mechanical arm that's lifting up a certain amount of weight. Let's say uh, you're lifting up a cube, kind of like an earlier game in FRC. Um, so... When you lift, when that arm goes up at a certain angle, if it's at a certain angle in the uh, not 90 degrees to the ground, it's actually going to feel less force than if it were, you know, parallel with the ground and that force is coming down 90 degrees. And again, it, it's much easier if you actually pick up something in your room right now, something heavy, you lift it out right in front of you, flat with the ground. You'll see that that's a lot more weight going down on your arm. You can feel it going down a lot more. Whereas if you lift it all the way up straight in the air, uh, like you're pointing at the sky, you feel almost no weight. It's just uh, your muscles feel none of that weight, it's just your bones. And then if you put it somewhere in between, you'll feel, of course, depending on how much closer you go parallel, you'll feel more and more weight. So did that did that help answer the question? You could have just said that last line was a little bit of first one. Would have been a lot simpler. Okay. But well, it was good, it was good. Just remember to go slow. Just to, don't like spiel off into other things. Yeah, for, for people who are into vehicles, perhaps, I don't know if anyone's into them, you are, you might have be familiar with pound-feet of torque in a vehicle. That's basically a similar concept with the wheels, how much force they apply when turning. That's basically what torque is. Yeah, because yeah. they use gears and all. That's not just the, yeah, because they use gears as well, and gears are just a bunch of intermittent uh, interlocking levers constantly pushing. So, yeah. Correct. Correct. Gears. We'll, we were actually going to get into that later in the presentation, but yeah, it's a oh, bit of a pre... No, 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 that, no, for sure. No, that's absolutely fine. Uh, gears are like interlocking levers, which is really cool. Um, a lot of people learn about gear ratio and things and they don't really understand, they don't connect the dots that it actually is just a lever. A lot of things actually boil down to being a lever if you kind of look at it. Um, a lot of concepts. It blew my mind when I found out. Like... For sure, for sure. Yep. Okay. Are there any more questions? Even if you're like, I have no idea what's going on, I'll accept that as a question. <laughs> With a little bit more guidance of what you want me to talk about. Will you learn this in grade 11 physics? Yes. Uh, I, well, I think you learned it in grade 8 physics. Well, I don't think they called it physics, but they just called it science. Um, but yeah. Any other questions? No? It's not, <laughs> okay. Uh, do you, okay, so we were here. I think we covered this already. It's pretty straightforward. Use materials that are easy to work with and cheap. For prototyping, use strong materials, good quality materials uh, for your final product. Okay, fasteners. How do you connect two different things? 
So you have two things that are separate and now you want to connect them. It could be a plate, it could be a C channel, it could be a box channel. Uh, there's basically two ways. You want to have, well, there's welding too, but typically we don't do that, uh, which is, that's an entirely different process. It's a permanent process um, of kind of basically melting the materials together, but we were, we're not going to get into that. Um, nuts and bolts and, sorry? Didn't Mr. G say we're going to weld everything? Mr. G, I don't think he's in in the school right now. Um, no, so I'm not sure about that, nor if the current manufacturing teacher is able to use that. Uh, and we definitely, I don't think welding everything together is a good idea, maybe for a final product, but with six weeks, you never know what's final and what's it, what's prototype, honestly. So having the ability to uh, remove or disconnect things is important, which is again, another advantage of nuts and bolts versus rivets. Um, but yeah. So nuts and bolts, you probably know it. It's a screw. It's, it's, it's an inclined plane uh, that's turning around, uh, which gives you a lot of mechanical advantage. So when you screw something on, you put the nut on it. Um, it stays there pretty firmly. Uh, and it's, it's clamping based on friction. And as well as the fact that it's going, you know, mechanically, uh, physically through the two holes that you pre-drill in the material. Um, off, the problem is though, oftentimes these, if just a normal screw and a nut can come loose with vibration, there's general over time. So to prevent that, you could use Loctite, which is a thread locker, kind of, you can think of it like, almost like you're gluing, uh, you're putting glue in the thread, not really, but you can think of it like that. Um, and then as well as lock nuts, which have a bit of nylon at the end, that kind of um, stop uh, vibrations from making it come loose. The other thing you can do is rivets. Um, so before we talk about rivets, I cannot really explain them properly, so I'm just gonna play this short video for you instead. Are strong lightweight fasteners. Here's how a pipe rivet works. A rivet has a shank and a mandrel. The rivet is inserted in a hole drilled through two materials. A rivet gun pulls on the top of the mandrel, expanding the shank. As the shank expands, pulling on the mandrel clamps the two materials tightly together. The force from the gun then snaps off the mandrel head at a pre-made breakpoint. It's called a pop rivet because of the sound the head makes when it snaps off. Okay, so I don't know how clear that came through. Um, but essentially, the way it works is you have this sort of rod in between, I think they call it a mandrel. Uh, and then when you pull that up, it kind of deforms the bottom of the rivet. It, it widens it past the point of the, the, uh, the diameter of the hole. So it's not able to come up and then it just kind of snaps off and you're not left with that long part anymore. So it basically, the force just expands the bottom of your rivet and it stops it from uh, coming th back through the material. And th these don't come loose over time, but the problem is to get them out, you need to drill out the hole, which is of course not great for iterating on things. Maybe a little bit better for a final design since you don't want things to come loose. Uh, but typ for typically when you're prototyping, you're never, you don't want to use them because to take them out, you should drill them out. Okay, so best practices. This is kind of a little bit of a different topic. Now we've kind of swayed away um, from structure. Well, this is still structure. We've swayed away from fasteners now. Uh, this is just general back best practices. Um, and we're going to go over many different things. So one of the best uh, practices is never to have cantilevers. Now, I should not say never, because there are designs that have worked well for teams in the past. Like if you guys know, maybe some of you guys know what a West Coast drive is. That's an example of a cantilever um, working well. If you don't, no problem. Um, but typically you want to avoid cantilevers in your design. Reason being that uh, that puts a lot of strain on, on on the fixed end and the free end is able to move a lot. Like you, like you can see in the diagram, it's often much weaker. It, it places a lot of strain on your shaft, whether it's a shaft or, or you're on your beam. Um, so definitely you don't want to do that. Um, you know, sometimes, as I mentioned, it does work, but typically you want to avoid it. Um, and the reason is it's the same concept with levers. Your fixed end essentially becomes your pivot and your free end uh, the more uh, becomes your le the length of your lever. So the more force you put on the end of that free end, uh, the more force the fixed end is going to experience. Um, and that's, and this, the, that's why you kind of went over levers. So now if you think about it, what we kind of learned in levers, the further you are from your pivot, uh, from your fulcrum or your, fit, or your pivot point, the more force you're going to experience. So if you must use a cantilever, what you want to try to do is minimize the distance from where your thing that's going to put force on it is to your fixed end. Make it as close as possible. Why? Because we, as we talked about in levers, the further you are, the more that force is magnified. So let's say you're mounting a wheel and you really don't want to put a channel on the other side. 
for whatever reason, maybe to minimize weight or to cut down on space. So then you want to put your hub as close as possible to the supporting part of your channel. That way, when the weight of the robot comes on the wheel and consequently into the fixed end, it's going to be not as magnified as if you had a really long shaft in the wheel at the end of that, which is likely either going to break the support at the fixed end or the shaft itself. Okay, so no cantilevers. Um, if you, unless you know, like, there's certain things that teams have done in the past, and if, the, if it's been proven to work, that's all right. But you do want to avoid cantilevers in your design. So that's uh, sort of what we're talking about here. You want to have two points of support on either end of your uh, shaft, or if it's a beam as well, if um, you don't want to have it sticking out. One point of support is never good. Uh, the thing is, if you, if you can't, if you can't support it on both sides, you'll at least want to have two points of support on one side of it. That's less than ideal, but it's better than just having one thin point of support. So two bearings on one side and maybe nothing on the other side, it's still not ideal. Best is to have two points of support on both sides, um, but it's better than just one point of support. So that's kind of showing over here. So the recommended support is to have one on each side. Um, but if you can't do that, again, try to minimize that gap because as we talked about with levers, the longer that is, the more force the fixed end is going to feel. And what's not recommended, of course, is to have just one fixed point of support and uh, have the wheel much further away. Though an another thing is if um, on that acceptable side, the, the one of the yellow check mark, uh, if you're the thing that's supporting your load, let's say you're bearing, or if you're not even using a bearing, you're just using a bushing. Um, if that's really thin, you're going to want to have it supported on two places that are kind of far away, not far away, um, but distance from each other on the other side. So even if you're not going to support on on each side, on the one side that you are supporting it, support it pretty well. Um, otherwise, that whatever you're supporting it with could uh, break, of course. Okay, so 90 degree angles. Uh, they're very good <laughs> when you're building structure. The reason they're very good is because materials will uh, sort of so I can read this out right now. This is because larger cross-sectional areas that is present in the right plane of, in the plane of force, so it's more rigid. What that means is, if you look at the sort of the brown background with the blue images, you see that this larger this larger area is better than the thinner area. Kind of makes sense, but what it's it's actually taking it from the side perspective, a two D side view. So if you look at an, uh, a flat piece like a flat channel, just a flat sheet of metal with no angles in it, if you look at it from the side view. You'll just see this really thin strip, which is what you see on the right-hand side of that brown background image. And then on the left-hand side, you're actually seeing the side view of either uh, a C channel or an L channel, which you actually have that whole other surface, which is 90 degrees. So you're actually seeing that. That's better because you have more cross-sectional area in your plane of force. So when you push down on that, you have a lot more support material. If you actually take, if you actually took that, um, if you actually took that uh, thin sheet of metal. It's really weak in if you press down on it in one way, but if you actually flip it 90 degrees and you try pushing down on the thin edge, it's going to be really strong because now you have a lot of cross-sectional area that is supported there. But when you're building in robots, you, you don't know exactly. Uh, you, you, can, you can get a pretty good idea, but you'll always have of where the force is going to come on certain structural elements, but there'll always be um, unforeseen forces. So that's why, you're all, that's why we always use either L channel, C channel, or box channel because that provides a lot more strength. Uh, typically box channel when you need the most amount of strength. And do keep in mind, though, the more strength you go for, um, the more weight that consumes as well. So uh, if like you can obviously get thick, everyone knows that a thicker material is going to be stronger, but that also means a lot more weight. And especially if that's on the end of like, let's say you're moving an arm and you're uh, pivoting it only from its turning point, it's, its pivot point. That means the more weight, that means the motor is going to do more work as well. So you, it's always a compromise between how strong you want something to be and how much weight it's going to add to the robot. Okay, so to kind of see what we're talking about here, uh, I'm going to give everyone a second to grab a piece of paper. All right, so it can be from your notebook. It can be small. It can be blank. You can have writing on it. It doesn't really matter. Just grab a piece of paper. I've grabbed mine. And what you're going to want to do is just hold your, put it on whatever table you're working on um, and just kind of put it on its very edge and let go. You'll notice that the paper bends over quite a bit. Um, it sags down a lot. But now what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to make a 90 degree bend in that paper. Okay. You're going to want to bend it kind of like shown in the image. And you'll see that it's now a lot stronger. It doesn't, it, uh, it doesn't sag nearly as much as it did before. Okay. And that's because of the same thing we're talking about is because it has a larger cross-sectional area. 
in the plane where the force is. In this case, the plane where the force is, is if you kind of look from a top down bird's eye view, if, and you put your hand straight down, that will be the plane of force. Because uh, that's gravity, right? The plane of force is the plane um, of which gravity is acting. So if you kind of imagine gravity as arrows, kind of like you see in some physics uh, drawings, that's the plane of force. And then since you have that bend now, typically the plane of force, the, the, the your cross-sectional area before was literally just the thickness of your paper, which is super, super, super low. It's not, it's not, it's not infinitely low. It has some thickness, but it's really low. This is why it was sagging. Whereas now with that bend, your cross-sectional area in the plane of force is actually the length of your flap. Like however long your vertical section of the flap is, that's your cross-sectional area now in the plane of force, which in this case is gravity. So bends make things a lot stronger. You never want to have a flat piece of plating unless you want it to bend under forces, which is pretty rare. Okay, so that was structure. Things that you want to stay rigid. Um, but here are now things that you want to move. So to get something moving, you might know that you need a motor. A motor, for our intents and purposes, you can think of maybe we'll go and probably a little bit more into this in the electrical lessons. But for mechanical side of it, it's just something that's going to spin a shaft. Now, what you do with that spinning shaft, whether you add a wheel to it or gears or pulleys or sprockets or whatever, it's something that's going to allow you to have rotational motion. So that shaft is going to spin. It's, it's, it's going to be able to spin either clockwise or counterclockwise, depending on programming and electrical. And then depending on the motor, it's going to be able to do that more quickly or more powerfully or both, right? So you have certain motors that have a lot more power. And when I say a lot more power, that means they have a lot more force and a lot more speed, both. And you have certain motors that have a lot less power. So that's less of those both things. Now you have some motors with internal gearboxes. So they, have, they might have the same amount of power, right? So they, have the, they might have the exact same amount of total power, but you're able to convert that power into either more speed or more torque. And we'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, so when you, anything that moves, so if you have one, if you have something that's moving and you have something that's not moving, okay? Let's say you have a, a shaft with a wheel on it. So that shaft is moving but then it's connected to a channel, which is something that's not moving. To connect those two things, because you need them connected, your shaft can't just be spinning in midair. It needs to still be connected to the channel, but you don't want the shaft, um, the shaft, the spinning of the shaft to create friction. So that's why you use bearings. Typically we will press, uh, we'll press fit bearings into holes, um, but sometimes we can use flange bearings and just put shaft collars on either end and, and it won't fall out. Probably don't want to do that because we saw how that ended up last year. By the way, if you didn't know, all our bearings would fall out and we have to constantly put them in. So uh, we want to press fit bearings into holes. Um, we can do that by making holes the exact size we want. Um, and we can actually do that with a little device called uh, a, boring, a boring bar. So basically that lets you get to the exact hole size you want. Um, so you kind of increase it a little bit by a little bit until the bearing goes in nicely. Um, and it doesn't, it's not able to come out with, unless you put considerable force into it. So the, okay, to reiterate the purpose of bearings, is you, uh, it's a connection point between something that doesn't move and something that does move. It provides a really low friction way to connect those two things. And you want to use them everywhere you have a shaft moving. You need a bearing. And, you know, we talked about having it. So that's the point of contact, by the way. Um, you know, you'd have a bearing on both two sides. Those are your two points of contact. You have a bearing on one side. That's your one point of contact, which is less than ideal, as we mentioned. So, this, so when, we, when we said a point of contact before, if I go back a little bit with this, um, if you're fixed end, free end, your two points of support, one point of support, those things over there, those would be bearings. The, and then, I mean, there would be channels as well, but the, the bearing would go inside a hole in the channel. And you can see a smaller hole in the bearing itself. That's where the uh, shaft would go. <clears throat> okay. So that's why, and that's when you'd use bearings. Shafts. So there's many different types of shafts. So we talked about um, putting shafts in bearings, and we said that shaft, you can connect a wheel to a shaft, you can put that in a bearing. Um, but they're literally just a piece, uh, a long metal where you connect, it kind of transfers torque, it transfers motion to anything you put on that shaft. The best way you want to do that is with hex shaft. And that's what we use in FRC. Um, you don't want to use D shaft, um, especially if that D shaft has uh, a set screw hub because those set screws will often get loose. And if they don't get loose, you'll tighten them so much that you damage the shaft. You definitely don't want cylindrical stock uh, just because they're not as good as transferring torque and if you use it you'll probably have to use a key and that gets messy because the key is hard to put in or if it's not hard to put in then it falls out pretty easily so the cleanest and easiest way to do it is with hex shaft um, we don't machine this ourselves we will get that shaft the hex shape made from uh, a supplier like Andy Mark or Vex Pro and the reason the hex shaft is so good is because you have uh, a hex collar with it or whatever you're mounting on the shaft is also hex shaped 
And what that means is, with, like, even without any screws, it's automatically going to convert torque. Like, it's going to transfer the torque. Like, if you had a hex shaft and then you have a hex hub and you put those two things together, you don't need any screws. And if you turn the shaft, the hub is still going to turn just because of the shape. It's not able to rotate, it's not able to free spin on the shaft because of the shape of the hex. Um, whereas if you had a cylindrical stock, it's just purely cylindrical, it will free spin and you need another mechanism such as a set screw or a key to keep that in place. Uh, still with the hex shaft, you still need to screw something in and that's primarily due to the lateral movement on the shaft. And when I say lateral movement, I mean like sliding along the shaft that needs to be prevented with a set screw. Um, but that's a lot easier to do and they're less likely to come loose especially because we in FRC uh, use clamping set screw, um, clamping screws. So clamping hubs, they're not actually set screws. Uh, they just kind of they lower the diameter of the hub. So kind of squeezes right onto that hex shaft. And that's what keeps it in place. Um, but the torque is actually always being transmitted due to the sh just purely the shape of the hex. I'll kind of take a break really quickly uh, to make sure there's not any questions because I kind of covered a lot of material. So... I'll, I'll give it around two minutes if there's any questions, um, and then we can continue from there. So I'll go, I'll go over, I'll go back so we can kind of cover what we talked about. Uh, so maybe that sparks any questions. So we talked about no cantilevers, which means support everything on both ends. And if you can't support everything on both ends, make sure that you have minimal gap. Yes to 90 degree angles or C channels. C channel, by the way, I didn't mention this. An L channel is the thing you see on the left because it looks like an L. <clears throat> the thing you see uh, in the middle, the channel you see in the middle, that's a C channel. Some people call it a U channel. You guess it because it's the shape of a C or a U. And then you have box channel because it's a box. Well, that's, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, and we talked about why, I mean, we did an experiment, hopefully you did it and just didn't listen to me talk about it. Uh, that if you bend, if you have an angle in something, you have a larger uh, plane you have a larger cross-sectional area in that plane of force that it's more, it's it's a lot stronger uh, in that plane. And then we talked about motors. Most people probably already knew what that was. Uh, we talked about how you want to have bearings, can be between anything that moves and anything that doesn't. What type of shaft we typically use in FRC and why we use that shaft and how it kind of goes along with the components and hubs we use on that shaft. So up till this point, is there any questions <clears throat> about sort of the best practices we talked about? No? Okay. Sounds good. Uh, we'll continue. Okay, so. That, that's valid. That, thank you, Maxwell. Yes, Vishesh. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Um, why? Uh, I'm just curious. Honestly, why don't we use. I know it's used. So I said I could hear you, but I didn't know you were going to cut out. <clears throat> I said I could hear you, but I didn't know you were going to cut out. So could you say that again? Uh, um, why don't we use keys? Because I know they're used industrially a lot. Right, just because um, FRC teams have found... Well, there's two reasons. One, it's just much easier not to. Um, because it's, like, you, you'll probably have to machine a key way. Like, you left have to... So if I go back to it... See that groove in the shaft, you'll likely have to machine that. With hex shaft, you don't have to machine anything. So often FRC, just because uh, we want to do what's easiest, right? Whatever is the simplest to do. And with hex shaft, what that means is literally taking a screwdriver and just screwing a screw in because you can buy the shafts pre-made. Um, and you'll often find that keys can break under a lot of force. They will often break um, or they'll just straight up fall out. Whereas that let, that rarely happens. Sorry? Sorry, my mic's kind of weird. But... Um... Do we run the risk of the shaft kind of wearing down due to like friction use and stuff? Like, can we round the hex shaft so that it starts slipping within the hub? Uh, so I I don't I highly doubt that would happen. Um, I've never seen it happen. Uh, if you're talking about like the shape, the hex shape getting rounded down into um a, a more cylindrical shape, I don't think that would happen. And if it did happen, you'd likely break your uh, key a lot earlier than you would round down your hex shaft. Um, that, that, that's pretty unlikely. You'd probably break, like you'd probably snap it before that happened. What's my favorite shaft? Right. Uh, no, no, actually, I remember oh, yeah. seeing the old hex shafts in uh, robotics where you had the, uh, what do you call it? The clamping ups used to be on. Mm -hmm. There is actual signs of wear, but 
it's very minimal. Right. It would be. They do actually they, they do take wear from actually having these egg shafts and uh, and the climbing ropes. They obviously do. I, I just wanted to say that. Right. Well, I mean, everything would take wear, but they would definitely like. I I don't want to say they definitely wouldn't get rounded down. But I do want to say that. Like, I'm sure you could find an example, right, of where someone does something absolutely insane and probably rounded down a hex shaft. But typically, no, that would not happen, even if it's put under a lot of force. Sounds good. Yeah, no worries. Thank yeah. you. No problem. Yeah, favorite shaft? Definitely hex. Hex is so good. Square, like square shaft from Vex, if you've ever worked at that, it's similar in terms of like the properties of it transmits torque well. Uh, but I do like Hex Spider just because it's more, a little bit more standard. I've only really seen <laughs> Square Shaft and Vex. I mean, it's in other places too, but Hex is kind of a standard. Especially in FRC, though, we use Hex over Square Shafting. Okay. Well, actually, I think there was another hand, wasn't there, when I initial? Well, oh, you have another question, Vishash? No, my bad. My bad. No problem. I think there was another hand with initially with Vishash's as well. Um... Sorry, I don't know your name. I can only see your student number. Uh, SS683403. Did you have your hand up uh, earlier? No? Okay. Sounds good. So, uh, we'll continue on then. We're almost going to come up to a wrap, but uh, let's just see if we can get this last thing in. So, we've been talking... Uh, I kind of hinted at it before um, about your ability to... Uh, convert uh, your speed into torque or your torque into speed. So that's kind of what you can do with gears. But fundamentally, gears uh, are going to allow you to take power from one spot and move it to another spot. Um, you're not going to be able to get very far because the gears have to be touching each other unless you want to have like several gears, which kind of becomes inefficient. Um, and there's a lot of moving parts in the system, which you never want if you can avoid it. Um, so, But it, it fundamentally, it's able to transfer uh, power. Uh, and kind of like Aditya hinted at before, a gear is nothing more than a spinning lever. So if you actually kind of, you know, maybe close your eyes and imagine it. If you take uh, just a wooden wheel and you cut a bunch of notches into it, and then you stick popsicle sticks into it, all right, one at a time, each popsicle stick can be thought of as a lever. And when that spins, uh, you know, that now you, now you have multiple of those, you'll never lose contact. That's basically what a gear is. You now take those popsicle sticks, you make them a lot shorter, you make them uh, fit. Uh, you change the shape so it fits into each other nicer, um, so you don't get a lot of slipping. And now you have a gear. There's actually a video that I'm going to post as a resource that's uh, really good to explaining how gears work and how they relate to levers. Uh, and I'll post that with the extra resources after this video. Um, so, but then, so what we can do with gears though, is since we talked about them being levers, we talked about how levers have force multiplication. You can use, you can get mechanical advantage from a lever. So you can do the same thing with gears. So let's say you wanted more uh, speed. All right, we'll start with speed. Because last year's game was shooting balls. Uh, you wanted to propel a ball out of the robot. So you want your flywheel to be spinning really fast. Um, let, and your, let's say your motor doesn't spin that fast. Uh, when you get it, it actually it's, it has a built-in gearbox. Let's say you can't change it for some reason. It has a built-in gearbox, and it's really high torque. So you want to now convert that torque into speed. What you're going to want to do is you want to take a really large gear as your input, and a really small gear as your output. And that's going to actually give you a lot of speed. But it's not magical. It's not just going to give you more speed. It's going to take away your torque to give you more speed. Reason being is the fundamental idea here is that power in a system remains constant. I kind of hinted at that before as well. In this case, we can, we can talk about the power being your speed multiplied by your torque. So when you decrease your speed, or let's say in this case we're increasing it, right? So when you increase your speed, but you decrease your torque, your total power stays the same. So the more you go ahead and increase your speed, the less torque you're going to get. In this case, torque being, again, remember, that's a rotational force. How much power you have when you turn something. But we can go the other way, too. If we want more torque, we can actually take a smaller input gear connected to a larger output gear. Now, that's going to give you more force and less speed. And if you think about it, it kind of makes sense because if you have a, let's say now we switched back to our speed analogy or our speed scenario, I should say, you have your large input gear and for every, like, uh, for every rotation it makes, it's going to spin the smaller one several times. And that makes sense um, because, it, you know, it's moving so much circumference on the outside. It's so much larger, whereas the smaller one uh, is so much smaller. So 
that's a bad example. But let's say f- for a certain gear set, for two gears that mesh together, uh, they're going to have the same pitch, which means the way the teeth and the amount of teeth per total distance is going to be the same. So we can just consider how many teeth there are for two meshing gears. So with a gear that has more teeth, one rotation is going to actually uh, spin so many more teeth compared to this, this lesser amount of teeth on the smaller gear. So let's say you have 50, you have 100 teeth on one gear. So when that spins one time and it's connected to a gear that has 50 teeth, it's spun 100 teeth worth, it's spun a worth of 100 teeth, right? So the smaller gear must now rotate with it exactly what it does because they're connected. But its size is only 50 teeth. So how is it going to make up for the same amount of rotation, the same amount of distance? It's going to spin twice, which is why if you have a bigger gear connected to a smaller gear, you get more speed. Because now it's like for one rotation of that big gear, you get two rotations of the small gear. And also, since you, now we know it's going twice as fast, that means you get twice as less torque. So you're twice less, uh, you're, not, you're half as much powerful, but you're twice as fast. Again, that applies to more torque as well. So the total power in your system is conserved. Um, an example of that, uh, a kind of how that could be a problem, the fact that your total power is conserved, is like uh, on one of my robots that I was building, I wanted my intake to be faster, right? Because I was intaking an object and it was really slow, so I wanted to make it faster. I increased the gear ratio, uh, so I made, so I, I should say I made it, I, I changed the gear ratio so it, it had it would spun faster. But now the problem is every time I tried intaking it, the motor would stall because the motor, you know, it it would spun really fast when it was free spinning. But as soon as it touched the object, it would stall. It wouldn't actually be able to pick it in. It would just freeze because the, there was, they didn't have enough power, they didn't have enough torque to put it in. So how can you resolve that? You can just you can actually change the power in your system by adding more motors or adding a motor that's more powerful. In my case, I added another motor. So that means that power in my system, the total power in my system doubled, which means I, I had more room now to stay with the same torque and get more speed out of it. But with the same motor, the power in your system is gonna be constant. So do keep in mind, it's not magical. You can't just keep going and adding as much torque and as much speed as you want. You're taking away from one when you get the other. The only way to get more of both is to get more power and the way to do that is either put more motors into whatever system you're building or get a more powerful motor but in frc you're kind of restricted at how much how much uh, power a motor can output because you're either going to trip your breaker or it's simply not allowed in competition okay so th- those are the concepts of transferring power um, and how you can trade speed for torque or torque for speed so now all these concepts we talked about are actually going to so, all right, perfect. So this actually, I did link the video already in these slides. Um, this is the video I was wanting to show you, but considering the fact that we only have five minutes left, I'm going to leave that as an exercise for you to watch yourself um, because these slides will be given to you. Uh, so I'll skip that for now. Been, Pardon? They have been given. Have, perfect. They have been given to you. So, no, no. Okay. So... Other types of gears. You have spur gears, which are, for all, all intents and purposes, your normal gears. Those are the ones we first talked about. Uh, they're called spur. If you want to be fancy. You have bevel gears, which work at 90 degree angles. So it's really cool because if you don't have a lot of space in one plane, like you don't want to take up a lot of space on your drivetrain, you can flip your motor 90 degrees, have it hors- a vertical, and you can still transfer that power in 90 degrees. So when your pinion gear spins, it'll turn the other bev- the larger bevel gear and now you're transferring power at a 90 degree, 90 degree angle. Similar concept for the worm gear. Uh, your difference is you actually get a lot more mechanical advantage. And more importantly, so the worm gear, actually I should mention, well, let me tell you which one is which. So the spur gear is the first one you see on the upper hand row column, on the upper column, row, upper row, yeesh. And then the second one on the upper row is your bevel gear. And your third one on your upper row, kind of with the golden uh, gear in there, the yellow one, golden one, that's your worm gear. The advantage of that is it cannot be back driven. What that means is, uh, so your motor can spin whatever mechanism you have, but then outside forces cannot back drive it. So let's say we have an arm, the motor can lift that arm up, but no matter how much force you put on that arm, um, it's not going to have any. Uh, it's, it's not going to go up or down, and not because the motor is holding it there, because but because mechanically it's being held due to the shape um, of the worm gear. So it cannot be back driven. Only the motor can move it. You can't move it externally which is really helpful. Like let's say you're trying to climb, um, like you have, you have a lift and you're trying to lift the entire robot up, but at the end of the game, the power to your robot is cut off. If you use a worm gear, it doesn't matter if the power is cut off because mechanically it's holding itself. 
So it does not require any motor power um, to hold its position. And then finally, you have a rack and pinion gear, which basically is going to translate your rotational motion of a shaft to linear motion. Because if you're wondering, how do I... Okay, if I want to make something go straight, but my shaft only rotates, how can I do that? Well, there's a couple of ways. One of those ways, as it relates to gears, is a rack and pinion system. Where you're, you, um, and that, by the way, that's the one on the bottom row, on the left-hand side. When your uh, gear rotates, it's going to kind of push or pull that uh, rack pinion, which is the long strip that's called the rack, and the pinion is the thing that looks more like your spur gear. It's going to pull or push that, and that's going to convert your uh, rotational motion into your linear motion. Uh, and then let's, let's quickly wrap up here. This is our last, uh, second last slide. Gear boxes. That takes everything we talked about with gears, but instead of having like a humongous, like let's say you want to really drastically change your speed, you're not going to have a humongous uh, in, uh, input gear and then really small output gear because that's going to take up a lot of space. Instead, what you, what you can do is you can actually um, connect those gears uh, to each other. So that's called a gear train. So let's say you have a small gear connected to a big gear connected to a small gear, and then on the same shaft at another spot, that small uh, that, that connects to now a big gear, and now that connects to a small gear, and then over and over and over. So that you're actually now applying that uh, that speed factor multiple times. And if you were wondering how to calculate that, you just actually just multiply whatever factor it was. So if it's two times faster um, in the first stage, and then it's two times faster again, you just multiply that two times two, you now it's four times faster. So you can actually build those together, and you can get drastic changes. And that's what gear boxes are for. The one on the left is one from Vex Pro. And the one on the right is one from Rev Robotics. So those are going to be able to drastically um, change your speed and torque. Um, the good thing is those two examples are actually modular. So you can quickly and easily swap out these kind of layers like you, like you can see in the bottom image. And you'll easily be able to switch between many different gear ratios. So kind of iterate um, and see what works. Last slide here, we only have two minutes left. Uh, you got sprocket and chain and belt. I've kind of merged them because fundamentally they're, I mean, they work differently, but for our purposes and their use cases, they're similar. So sprocket and chain um, is the advantage is you can actually take, you can convert, you can move your motion. Uh, you can change your rotate. Like we talked about initially gears uh, moving the rotation um, from a certain point, but they have to be touching. So you can't really move it too far without adding a bunch of gears. Sprocket and chain, you can move that really far apart because now you're just using two sprockets and the chain goes in between them. So it's like gears, but they're they're real, they're at a far distance, and chain connects the two points. Um, and you want to make sure that chain is tight and not dangling or loose. Uh, you can kind of see a little bit of an illustration of how that works, how chain works at least as outer links and inner links, and they kind of intermesh with each other, um, and you're able to break that uh, chain, reassemble it to get it to the length you need. And belt is also very similar. Uh, it's just that it's much lighter, much more quiet. Um, specifically, this is timing belt, so it has a little bit, a little grooves on it, and then it has a pulley, which is able to, um, very similar to how sprocket and chain works, uh, but again, just a lot lighter. So you can basically think of um, sprocket and chain or timing belt and pulley as gears at a distance. The gear ratios and speed ratios still apply, and with that, I think it's three fifty nine. So I'll be, um, I'll be kind of wrong not to give you guys some time to ask some questions before we have to go now. So that's the last of the presentation. Um, that's the last.